Gracious God, we hope that we pray that you will open our eyes and our ears to what you would have us notice today, and then you keep anything from preventing us from preaching the word. We pray for all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I open with a prayer like that because I woke up somewhat ill this morning, feeling a little bit unwell and woozy. I thought I was going to keel over at the 7.30. And so I warned my fellow priests of this, and they said, well, you got to get through the sermon. Uh, I don't write down my sermons, and so they're a little bit worried. And so I'm going to do the equivalent of the ALS ice bucket challenge, but it's the ASC preaching challenge. Should I keel over, I nominate Sally Howard, Susan Russell, and Francisco. He's off and run off. Francisco Garcia. Just, just. Ah, okay, here we go. What a great gift that Jesus gives Peter and by extension us in this reading today. He says to Peter, you are the rock on which I build my community, my church, and the gates of death cannot prevail against it. And then he says, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven and whatever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. No strings attached. Full empowerment. It's so different from the way we um, get keys from one another in our human lives, isn't it? I remember very well when my daughter was 12 years old and she said, I'm too old to go to after school daycare. I want to come home after school and I want the keys to the house. <laughs> and I said, yeah, you know what, she's 12. And I said, sure, you can have the keys to the house and here's my 24 rules that go along with the keys to the house. Right? Don't have a friend over without telling me and their parents. Don't answer the door if there's a stranger at the door. If a stranger is on the phone, don't tell them you're home alone. Do your homework first, yada, yada, yada. There were all these strings attached to my daughter getting the keys to our palatial estate. <laughs> and yet Jesus just hands it over, I mean metaphorically, obviously, to Peter and says, here you go, here are the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about two other typical ways that this passage is interpreted because I take issue with them and I kinda of need to explain to you why I'm taking issue with them so I can offer what I think Jesus might be saying. In the traditional Roman Catholic interpretation of this passage, um, it is said that Jesus is empowering Peter, ordaining him, giving him the teaching authority of the church from that time henceforth into eternity until it ends to determine what is true and right teaching and doctrine in the church. And this authority is handed down through the popes and hopefully the cardinals and bishops as well. And by the way, that notion exists in other churches that have bishops, such as the Episcopal Church. Um, they also have the authority to determine what is right and wrong, to make ethical decisions about what can be bound and what can be loosed. And what is bound is what's not permitted and what is loosed is what is permitted. Now, a lot of this is based on sound biblical teaching. Um, the idea of being, things being bound and loose comes from the Jewish tradition of halachic law. And then the Jewish tradition, both in the, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, as well as in the ongoing tradition of rabbinical scholars, they, they look into the word and they make very fine and careful ethical distinctions based on the culture of their time and the things that are happening and various contingencies that can affect the law, the halakhic law. And so it, there's a fine tradition of that. The only thing is, Jesus never really liked the rules that human beings were making for, no, for one another. In addition, he didn't really like what pe the questions people asked him about getting into heaven, and so the other typical interpretation of this passage is the more Protestant one where they say, well, Peter gets into heaven, in other words, he, he gets that entrance key because he says, I believe in you, Jesus. He has that personal faith in Jesus Christ as Savior. I think Jesus is getting at something different, and I'm actually feeling a little bit silly that saying, no, they're wrong and I'm right, but I just, I really think that Jesus means something else. Think about how Jesus reacts whenever somebody talks to him about the rules or tries to get him to make an ethical ruling. There's the time when the Pharisees come to him and they say, say a woman marries a man and he dies and then she marries his brother and he dies and then she marries the next brother and he dies and so on. Seven husbands later, what an unlucky wife. Um, they said, when she dies and goes to heaven, to whom will she be married? And Jesus <laughs> just looks at them and says, there is no marriage in heaven. It's an, it's an annoying question to him. He's, they're trying to get him to make this distinction and he's not willing to play the game with them. 
Or think about the time when they're saying, well, why are you performing miracles or healing on the Sabbath? And he says, you know what? The Sabbath is made for humankind. Humankind is not made to serve the rules of the Sabbath. Or look at the young rich man. He says to Jesus, how can I get eternal life? In other words, how do I get the keys to the reign of heaven? And Jesus says, well, so have you been following the commandments? And he says, yes, I have. I've been following all of them since my youth. I'm such a good rule follower. (laughs) And Jesus says, well, for you, there's another thing. Give up everything you own. Sell it and give it to the poor. In other words, the entrance to the kingdom of heaven is not due to following the rules, although I'm not saying the commandments aren't important. It's not about following the commandments. It is about unloosing, unbinding anything that is keeping us from fully allowing God into our lives, anything that is keeping us away from God existing in us. To me, the key to this passage is to looking at what, to look at what Jesus means by the kingdom of heaven. What have I gotten the keys to? That's what I want to know. What can I open now? And he says a lot about the kingdom of heaven. So one of my favorites is from the, the Gospel of Luke. He says, the kingdom of heaven is within you. Or, also translated, among you. I like both of those. I think they're both true all the time. In you, among you. He also says, the kingdom of heaven is near you. You are near the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's one of my favorite ones because it's right there. You can just grab it. In the Gospel of Matthew a few weeks ago in the lectionary in chapter 13, Jesus uh, is doing that parable of the mustard seed. And then he sets up a series of comparisons, similes. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like. And then he compares it to a number of things that are small hidden, sometimes subversive, and negative in some way, but then they grow into something that explodes. So, for example, he says the kingdom of heaven um, is like a small mustard seed. And he says it's buried in the ground, and then it grows into a wonderful tree that shelters all these birds. But mustard seeds um, bred bred weeds. Mustard was like a weed. It, It choked out the wheat in wheat fields, so the Jews of his time didn't like mustard seed. It was subversive, something to be gotten rid of. Second thing he says, the kingdom of heaven, um, this may not be in the right order, the kingdom of heaven is like some yeast that a woman puts in a little, in a, some flour to make bread. Well, as you know, in the Jewish tradition, yeast is considered, at least for Passover, a negative ingredient. Use unleavened bread, no yeast, so that you can flee oppression, flee oppression and find freedom quickly. So yeast is a weird thing to be comparing the kingdom of heaven to. And then he says, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure that somebody found, a.k.a. stole, and then went and bought a field and buried it in that field so that nobody else could enjoy that treasure except that person. In each case, notice that the kingdom of heaven is compared to something small, hidden, buried. The kingdom of heaven is within you. Now, to me, one of the best expositors of this notion in the Christian tradition is Teresa of Avila. Uh, She was a 16th century nun in Spain. Uh, She considered herself a rather unremarkable nun in her 20s when she first started. And then in her early 40s, she started experiencing rather um, dramatic, significant, mystical experiences such as suddenly falling into raptures, or experiencing talking to God, um, hearing things, and so on. And uh, this raised a lot of red flags for the religious authorities of her time. She was told to work with really good spiritual directors, and they told her to spend a lot of time developing her interior prayer life and to write down what was happening to her, and to instruct others as well. I have to tell you, she was very controversial in her time for these writings. One of the books, is called The Interior Castle. And in it, she develops two key metaphors about the kingdom of heaven within us. She says that by developing our prayer lives, we build the kingdom of heaven within us, our souls, within our souls. Um, And how we do that is we practice various types of prayer. She talks about mental prayer. Mental prayer being, you know, you sit and you think about things, you recollect your day. It might be things you want to celebrate, things you regret. 
you visualize things, so you might visualize uh, Jesus performing a miracle or Mary Magdalene running and discovering the grave, or you know, you'd visualize a moment, some important moment in gospel stories, and then reflect upon that. And then you progress, that those are in the outer rooms, and then you progress towards the inner rooms, the interior rooms of this castle where the king is kept. And that is where you experience the prayer of union, where you feel completely at one with God and sort of a quiet, contemplative prayer. Now she calls that central room where his majesty is. And this is a very old fashioned medieval Christian thinking of Christ the king, you know, the God is the majesty. But she does something very interesting for a woman of her time. She also says, it's not just God dwelling in there. Our soul is her majesty or his majesty. It is the soul that is unassailable by all the things that can, that can hurt it in this world, all the tragedies and travails that can happen in this world. And she says, when you can get into that castle, nothing can happen to you. You are the king or queen of that castle. Now that's one metaphor she developed. So she says, God dwells, when you build it, God dwells in this castle. And she also says that we dwell, all of us, in God. And I was running this past my daughter and she goes, I don't get it, how can God dwell in our castle with us and we also dwell in God? And I said, uh -huh. that's where God gets tricky. I don't know, I really don't know. Um, <laughs> however, there's this second metaphor that's really cool. She compares us to silkworms. And now silkworms, the way they make silk is that they consume mulberry tree leaves and then they excrete little blobs of silk. And they spin 30,000 times to spin a white cocoon, a beautiful soft white cocoon that surrounds them and protects them until they are ready to burst out of it and be a white butterfly for a brief period of time. She says that our prayers are like the worms spinning the silk out of their bodies and creating this cocoon around us. And God both dwells in that cocoon with us and also is the master silk maker. So what a silk maker does is after the butterflies get out of the cocoons, they take the cocoons and they refine them into this beautiful raw silk and they form it into this lovely cloth that is made into royal garments. God is this great silk maker, she says, who makes this wonderful garment. It is, by the way, a very important Jewish metaphor. Now, she was made a doctor of the church um, in 1970 by Pope Pius VI, I think. She was made a saint in the 1600s, but it took him to the 1970s to name a woman a doctor of the church for the first time. Now what that means is that the, the powers of the church have determined that her teaching is so right and so good that's an official church doctrine that will be held true for all time. Yay! <laughs> and here was that amazing teaching. She said, this kingdom within, this interior castle, this cocoon, can be built by anybody. She said it is not available simply to some miraculously holy people like St. Francis or St. Benedict. Um, it's not just for ordained people. It's not just for monks and nuns who dedicate their lives to serving God. It is available to anybody who is willing to pray. That was the revolutionary teaching that made them decide in 1970 that she needed to be a doctor of the church. And how do we do it? We do it by engaging in prayer, a variety of types of prayer, but in her case, always prayer done quietly alone. We enter into our cocoon or we go into our interior castle and we shut the door with God. I find it very interesting that in the Isaiah passage today, um, there are, there's a series of urgings from God. It's the voice of God speaking through third Isaiah who says, listen to me, people. Look, look, listen, look up and look. He is urging people, God, not he, God is urging people to turn within and to listen to the voice of God, to look for signs of God rather than to worry about what is happening in all the human travails around them. It's an urging to engage in this prayer practice, to tune in to God and to tune out other things that are distracting one from one's ability to tune into God. 
Now, it might sound that this sort of, uh, I was worried that this sounded like a little of kind of a feat, elitist practice of a highly educated, upper-class, medieval nun in Europe. She got really good at prayer, so what? But in fact, Teresa of Avila was persecuted in her time um, for a variety of reasons. She was living at the time of the Reformation and the Catholic Counter-Reformation. This is at a time when all different types of Christians were burning one another at their stake, fighting wars with one another, killing one another. And she was trying to get back to a sort of essential Christianity, in her case, Catholicism, that got rid of some of the things that were going wrong in the Catholic Church. She was a reformer of the church. And for that reason, they went after her. They also went after her, the Spanish Inquisition, because her grandfather and her father were Jewish. And as you know, the Spanish Inquisition tried to drive Jews out of Spain and succeeded to a certain extent. They converted to Christianity, and yet they were still run through the streets. Um, and she herself was hauled before the Inquisition because they wanted to know, are you really Christian? Or are you just pretending to be Christian? How authentic are your teachings? That's why I wanted to point out that silk garment metaphor because it's one that's very common in Jewish teaching. So when we look at what's going on in our time and we hear her saying that the castle within is the one place where you are unassailed by the terrors and the anxieties and the fears and the pains and the tragedies of your life, we can apply it to similar things going on in our life. We know that the news has been really difficult as Francisco preached so beautifully last week. We have the happenings in Ferguson, Missouri still going on, the things still going on in New York City and LA, Gaza, the bombings in Jerusalem, Iraq, the earthquake this morning in Northern California. And there are times when it assails the soul and it feels like it's just not going to stop. And I am suggesting to you that sometimes we have to turn off the news and we have to find and build this interior castle. I am not suggesting that we run away from the conflict in this world. What I'm suggesting is that we cannot build the kingdom of heaven out there until we at least start building the foundations inside our own selves, finding this unshakable rock of peace and stability so that when trouble comes for us, when even the simple anxieties come for us in life, we have this relationship with God inside us that will carry us through these things. That is what the voice of God is saying in this passage from Isaiah. He says, hey, the garments are going away. Look up to the heavens, they will go away. Look to the earth and all the inhabitants upon it. They will die like flies. But my salvation will last forever. What Jesus is giving us is the keys to the kingdom of heaven within us, the reign of heaven within us. He's giving us full empowerment, full permission, no, no qualifications, no strings attached to build this heaven within us. He's saying we can build a heaven and we can build a hell. We can unloose, unbind ourselves from those things that are causing us this trouble in this world. We can loose up, loosen up other things inside us that are restricting us, that are keeping us from meditating and opening those doors inside us. We can build heaven or hell. Let's open the doors to heaven. Amen.